You're all very welcome to Coffee Retail Summit. My name is Stephen Morrissey. I'm the <clears throat> Deputy Chief Commercial and Community Experience Officer for the Specialty Coffee Association, and it's an honor to be here with you today. Um, we are joined for our next panel today, um, for the second session, by Luisa Castellanos, who is the co-founder and COO of Science on Call, a boutique IT consulting agency dedicated to helping independent coffee shops and retailers with technology. Um, Today, their uh, low-cost subscription service, Science on Call, is helping coffee shops, restaurants, retailers navigate the pandemic and the future of tech and hospitality. Um, so please join me in welcoming Louisa. Hello, could you hear me and see me? Yes. All right, great. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so as he mentioned, I am the co-founder and COO of Science on Call. We have helped over a hundred different restaurants, coffee shops, retailers, dealing with technology during the pandemic, even before the pandemic and post pandemic. So we have seen it all. We have dealt with just about every kind of technology issue from internet outages, online ordering, not going through contactless payment transitions, all the great stuff that we've probably all experienced at least a few times at this point in the long ongoing pandemic. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what trends we've seen and where we're seeing the future of technology in the restaurant, retail, hospitality industry. Um, and so just to kind of kick it off, um, here's a, a great slide about the name of this presentation, Technology and Retail and the New Normal. So I'll sort of start out talking about the technologies that we see a lot of operators using. And you know, for any of you that are coffee shop owners or retailers or restaurant owners, you've pr probably all seen or heard about some of this. Um, I'll give a few tips on things that have worked for our customers, things that haven't. And uh, I'm also happy to take more questions after the fact if, if I didn't touch on something that you wanted to hear more about. All right, so as we know, restaurants and hospitality cannot survive without technology. There's a picture of a, a barista right here working with all these lovely tablets and computers and printers and probably taking online orders, maybe punching them into the point of sale. And, you know, it's, it's just part of the job now. So it's nothing new. Um, maybe you've dealt with it before. If you've worked in a coffee shop, the breakfast rush, the morning rush, and you're trying to serve your customers, but at the same time, you're trying to make sure that online orders are coming through or credit cards are processing. So this is a pretty common situation for many coffee shop owners or retailers. Um, and so this is a, you know just an example of what we're probably all dealing with right now. So let's talk a little bit about the solutions that are really essential to technology, to retail today. Um, and I'll, I'll give a few examples. So this is sort of a, a list of what we've seen in restaurants and retail establishments. Um, pretty much you can't survive without these. Um, so first off, internet and Wi-Fi, everything revolves around your internet at this point. You probably have your point of sale connected to it, your phone system, your printers, your online ordering, your website, all of this revolves around, revolves around internet. And um, you know everybody thinks like, oh, my Wi-Fi is down. Well, it could be so much more than that. It could be that there's a local outage. It could be that your router or your modem isn't working correctly. Everyone's heard the the classic unplug it and plug it back in scenario. Um, and it, yes, it works some of the time, but sometimes it doesn't and you're stuck without internet for hours at a time. That can cost hundreds of dollars for um, anyone who's processing credit cards or taking online orders. Um, and something that we've actually seen a lot with our customers is experiencing an internet outage on a busy Saturday. We had one customer um, you know, their typical hourly sales are over $500. And um, so without internet, that would have meant, you know, thousands of dollars lost if they weren't able to stay connected. And, you know, another thing too, when you don't have internet, um, and you've probably, if you haven't experienced this in your own shop, 
but out and about you you go to a place and they give you the classic oh sorry we can't take credit cards right now or our system isn't working um that is also a, a huge loss because you might be turning away paying customers and so something that we always always stress is stable internet um, and something that we've actually helped some of our customers implement is backup internet so having a failover for your primary internet that rolls over to you know like a 4g lte backup that is a great great solution and can save a ton of money and prevent any of those outages um, so with point of sale, this is a huge topic for every retailer that's out there. You pretty much have to have some way of accepting credit cards, taking orders. Um, it could be maybe you have one of those old banger cash registers. We like to joke about those kind of being like the dinosaur way of doing things. Um, but over the last you know six years since we've been running our company, this has changed so so much. Um, you know there was the classic NCR and Aloha systems that any of you who've worked in the industry for a long time have probably worked on. Um, there was always, you know, those classic like touchpad screens. Um, there was always issues and not a lot could be done on the fly when you're working behind, you know, behind the counter. And so um, when you come to point of sale in the modern age, you've probably seen Toast, Upserve, Square, those are some of the bigger ones that are very common today. Um, one of the great aspects of the changes in point of sale is that they've allowed for a lot of extra integrations. So uh, later on this list, we're gonna talk about online ordering. Um, there are several point of sale systems you can use to integrate online ordering, whether it's your own native online ordering, so taking orders from your website or, um, online ordering or um, taking orders through in person. Um, but point of sale is, is obviously very, very important. Um, all right, so I'll also talk about phone systems. Um, you know, you could sign up for a phone plan with your internet service provider, or maybe you have, you know, just a, a cell phone that everyone at the shop uses. Um, this is another reason why internet is so important is because there are voice over IP systems you can use that allow for you to not even use a classic phone line and you can use the internet to use your phone. But again, if the internet goes out, your phones are down, your customers can't reach you. That can be a huge problem. Um, you know, People are trying to find out if you're open, trying to figure out how to order. Um, and this is another reason why technology is just so important to the customer experience. If they can't get a hold of you, if they can't place an order, they're going to be frustrated. Um, printers. Printers are definitely something that I'll talk about a little more later, but the classic Epson printer, or kitchen printer, uh, Expo printer, these are probably another area where you, you as a coffee shop owner or staff are probably experiencing issues all the time where either you punched in an order at the counter and it didn't go through or maybe you are using some sort of third-party delivery apps like uber eats grubhub postmates and all of a sudden the orders aren't printing from those third parties um, that could mean you missed an order or it could mean that you don't know what the customer was trying to order and so making sure that everything is all synced together with your point of sale and your online ordering system is super, super important. Um, and, you know, we tell our coffee shop customers all the time, you know, you're, you're good at what you do. You're a barista, you're a coffee shop owner, you're not an IT person. To understand all the intricacies of IP addresses and adding new devices to your point of sale, it's pretty complicated. So um, that's, that's something that we, are really really helping our customers with a lot is these you know all these different complexities with printers um, it could also be a printer on site for um, just printing menus it could be you know just your office printer um, that's another thing that internet is super important is making sure your printer is connected and your device is connected to the printer your desktop your laptop whatever it might be Online ordering, so I already talked a little bit about how that relates to your point of sale. There are so many different apps out there for online ordering and 
some of you may have heard of like Olo or Hunger or um, obviously Toast and Chow Now. There's so many different systems out there. Every time you order food, there's something new. Maybe they have a custom built website. Um, but this is obviously the way that everybody has been getting their food for the last year. And so if you haven't figured this out yet, you're going to have to because it's not going away. Um, we have several of our customers that have experienced over 400% growth in online orders during the pandemic, which is just crazy, but it makes a lot of sense. People aren't going out. They're not dining in. Um, even coffee shops can use it if they are experiencing long wait times, you know, avoiding people crowding around the front of the shop. It's a great way to encourage your customers to order ahead and, you know, they can just walk in and pick it up. It's really easy. Um, and something I'll talk about later too is just the fact that so many more customers are used to ordering ahead. Whereas, you know, if you went to dine in at a restaurant, you might sit down, read the menu, order, eat your food, and then you pay. And so that's, you know, I don't think that's going away, but we'll talk about it more about how customers are becoming more used to paying ahead of time. Um, and so just making sure that your customers can order the way that they want to. Uh, I, I do have a question coming in, but I will save them to the, for the end. Um, and so I'll keep going. <laughs> um, online ordering, yes. So there are several different ways to do that. Um, and you know, as long as you have at least one, that's great. But another reason why you might have third parties is that a lot of customers are used to ordering from Grubhub or Uber Eats or Postmates. Maybe they have the app on their phone and that's just their default. Um, being on those systems is great. It can also help if you do not have your own delivery people. Um, so I have that on here too, is being able to deliver is a huge um, option um, for, for customers that don't wanna travel to your shop or um, leave the house <laughs> for any reason. Um, you know, This is another way that you can pass the cost off to customers is you know maybe uber eats is charging you 15 to 30 percent per order it may mean that you have to increase your prices but a lot of customers we're finding are very used to the additional fees at this point and so it, it really shouldn't be we you know we've talked to some some of our customers and they haven't experienced a drop in the orders that have been placed because of the higher prices it's just becoming the new normal is ex is expecting to pay a little bit more to have your food delivered um, because obviously someone has to get in their car or get on their bike to bring it to you. Um, you know, that's, it's just part of the way it is now. Um, let's see. So, you know, this all relates to online ordering as well as your website. There are so many great solutions out there for online ordering that integrate with your website. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we were helping a lot of our customers make really simple websites. So the name of your shop, some photos, your phone number, your address, and then maybe a big button at the top that says order now. It doesn't have to be complicated any anymore. You know, maybe 10 years ago, it made sense to pay thousands of dollars for a website. Today, it is not, it, there's just no reason to spend that kind of money. Um, even if you're not a tech savvy person, there are solutions like Squarespace or Wix or, um, you know, some people still like WordPress if, if that's your thing. But um, if you're not a developer, it, it's not rocket science to create a website anymore. Um, there's a lot of shifts as far as online ordering that is integrated with your website. So Square, for example, has released a totally new platform for online ordering that integrates with their point of sale. We'd love to see that because it it eliminates some of the complications between your website and your online ordering. So if somebody, or your point of sale. So if somebody places an order on your Square website, it goes through your point of sale, it prints a ticket in your kitchen. It's much easier to manage that whole process. Um, and e-commerce too, that's another thing we've seen a lot of customers adding to their toolkit is what kind of merch can we sell? Can we sell t-shirts? Can we sell mugs? Can we sell gift cards? Um, it's just another really great great way to kind of upsell your customers. Um, they're already buying something on your website and you know maybe they've been thinking about buying a new bag of beans and it's just right there. They can put a whole cart together and go pick it all up 
at the same time. I know I've done that many times where I'm like, oh, it doesn't hurt to just maybe I'll add like some extra bagels to eat tomorrow. And, you know, kind of, it's almost like grocery shopping. Like there's definitely a merge between grocery, retail and restaurants. Um, I'll talk more about this later too. Just the, the process of ordering has changed so much that you really need to have all of these systems working together to power your, your retail shop. All right. Um, so obviously, like I mentioned before, internet outages are a huge, huge loss to your shop. So, you know, not only are you losing money, but you're, you're ultimately impacting the customer experience. And that is the worst <laughs> situation you could be in is having a customer have a poor experience. Um, so internet outages can be a huge thing that's affecting your point of sale. It's affecting your ability to take credit cards. It's affecting your phone system. Um, there's so many stories we have of our customers calling us, you know, maybe it's 6 a.m. and they just opened and their point of sale isn't working. And we get those calls all the time. Frantic baristas trying to figure out how to make things work so that they can be prepared for their customers to place their orders. Um, another thing is, you know, maybe their website is down and people aren't able to place an order in the first place. They might just assume you're closed. Um, so that's lost money right there. Customers not ordering. Maybe you're cash only for the day and customers don't have cash. So they just go to the next coffee shop down the street. Um, and, you know, when that happens, and I'm sure you've all had this happen, is you placed an order, it didn't go through, or they messed something up. Um, and so that that ultimately will mean a poor poor review for your shop. They might, they might assume, and maybe it's the first time they've ever been there. They don't know that this is just sort of a one-time thing. Um, it can really leave a bad taste in people's mouths um, and could affect, you know, cost you hundreds of dollars. Maybe, maybe they were a loyal customer and they had a poor experience and then they decided it's not worth it to come here anymore because they've had so many poor experiences and then they'll probably tell all their friends and their friends won't come there. And so it's, it's really expensive to have those kind of issues come up. And then lastly, knowing your customers. So everybody ha at this point probably has a point of sale and within your point of sale, you're collecting all sorts of great information. So you have your, um, the, the names of your customers, you probably have their email, their phone number at this point. You probably know what they are ordering most frequently, um, what times of day people are ordering most frequently. Uh, you know, are they ordering, are they spending a lot of money? Are they spending a little bit of money? Um, and so there's just so much data out there that a lot of operators are not used to having. Whereas, you know, 10 years ago when you were just taking cash, you don't know who's in your shop, what they're buying you really didn't know anything. So it was a lot of just like, oh, I'm an owner and I know what my customers like. Everybody likes our pizza here or everybody likes our bagels. Um, but now you actually have the ability to prove it and go into your system and see who's ordering what and what's selling fastest. And a lot of that can be used to optimize your business. But obviously, you know, when you have a million things on your plate, data is probably not the most exciting thing to look at. Um, if you're you know, if you started a coffee shop because you really liked coffee, you probably don't want to sit and look at spreadsheets of all of your customers ordering habits. But because of the ability to collect this information, um, there's also other places where you can get information such as your, um, your Wi-Fi. And uh, something that we've seen throughout the pandemic is obviously people aren't in your shop. So they're probably not connecting to the Wi-Fi. Um, before you maybe you paid 50 bucks a month to have internet available to your customers. Um, we had so many of our customers canceling those types of subscriptions because why do you need it? You know, no one's in your shop, nobody's connecting to Wi Fi. So that was a huge uh, cost savings for many operators during the pandemic. Um, things like Zenreach or um, Troglo, there's a few others that we've worked with. Um, and, and so something that we've, we're really thinking about as a company is what is the future of Wi-Fi for your customers? Is it something that customers will want to come in and connect to your Wi-Fi and spend money 
you know, spend more money sitting at, at the cafe and ordering extra food. Um, that's something that you probably won't know until you're fully open. Um, and I think we, we are still a little ways away from people sitting at a coffee shop for three hours. <laughs> I don't know if we will ever go back to that, but there's a lot of opportunity to reinvent the wheel with this. Um, you know, maybe you're using QR codes. So when somebody's in the in the restaurant or coffee shop, they can scan the QR code, connect to your Wi-Fi, and maybe they get a free coupon when they connect. It's really one of the best ways to learn more about your customers. And maybe you're offering coupons, maybe they're viewing your website, maybe they're buying beans when they get to your website through the QR code. There's just a lot of opportunities as far as what you can market to your customers. And I know there's been several other uh, conversations that have been had as far as marketing in your restaurant or coffee shop. Um, and this is just one of the many ways that you can collect the information to more accurately market to your customers. Uh, maybe you're seeing that everybody's ordering bagels and that means, hey, maybe we should send out an e-blast or post on social media or buy one, get one free bagels. Um, it, it's not going to be the same for every customer. And there's a lot of ways you can customize that. So maybe you send out an e-blast to everyone who's spent over $100 in your cafe. Or maybe you spend you send an e-blast to people who haven't been there in a while. Um, and so it's a really great way to target based on consumer habits. All right, so I talked about printers earlier. This is such a fun topic to talk about because it's very techy. Um, so hardware, routers, printers, the real physical technology in your space is so important. It's not going away. As much as we like to think, oh, everything's Wi-Fi and everything's online ordering, there's real hardware required to make that all work. Um, you know, you're gonna need printers. You need your, your kitchen staff to know what orders are coming through. We're not quite at a, at a place where we can eliminate printers as much as we think we can, um, especially the kitchen printers. And a lot of the, this doesn't work without a hardwired connection. And I'm sure in, in, a, in a dream world, it makes sense to have all these Wi-Fi and Bluetooth printers, but more often than not, there's issues with that. There's just, they get disconnected really easily. And, you know, maybe you're going to miss an order because the printer, the Bluetooth printer didn't connect or somebody really needs a receipt and it's not printing. So we, we really do encourage people to hardwire their printers if possible. Um, and if you're not a cabling expert, there are a lot of great resources um, of people who do this kind of stuff um, that you could hire to help you and make sure that everything's working pro appropriately. Um, especially if you're opening a new shop, there's a lot of these things you're not thinking about. You're not thinking about how much bandwidth your internet needs to have, or how are the phones going to be connected, or what about your speaker system? All of that requires real hardware to be plugged in somewhere and needs to be working 24-7, or you know, however long you're open, it needs to be working all the time. And so you want to have the best setup possible so that you don't experience issues. And then when you experience issues, then you have poor customer experience. All right, so the new normal, we're already here. COVID's coming to an end, hopefully soon, um, but a lot of this is not going away. And you know, the, the industry had a lot of problems in the beginning. Uh, at the, you know, before COVID, there was a lot of issues with low margins and difficulties with labor and, you know, the list goes on and everybody's experienced them. But as far as the customer experience, people have gotten used to ordering a certain way. Those habits aren't going away. Maybe people will, you know, people will be in person more, but they're already used to a lot of this contactless, really seamless experience. So, you know, these are a few examples of ways that customers are placing orders. Obviously, QR codes are everywhere. Uh, it's a really great free tool that you can use to allow your customers to scan and view a menu, scan to place an order, scan to maybe connect to your Wi-Fi. Um, and it's as simple as just printing one of these out and customers can use their own phone. Um, and so 
contactless payment is another great way. Um, if you don't have QR codes, maybe you want people to just go directly to your website. Um, maybe you're doing some kind of ad campaign or email blasts and you want them to order from your website. You can lead people straight there. They can order. They never have to talk to a real person. They never have to be in close proximity to your staff. Um, and they can just purely scan a code or go on the website. Um, and I, I mentioned this earlier too, the, the idea of ordering ahead is saving people time. A lot of people don't want to wait in line. They don't want to order and sit around for 15 minutes to wait for their food to be ready or their coffee to be ready. And so I think in the future, we're definitely going to see a lot more of that. People are used to ordering ahead. Um, maybe they're ordering from a third party app like Grubhub or Uber Eats. And that's just the way they have become used to it because of COVID. Um, there are a lot of ways you can actually encourage people to order direct, which we, we try to tell our customers to do so because you're really, you really want those to be customers forever. You want to build that relationship. You want them to order directly from you. There's a, you know, we have dozens and dozens of stories of DoorDash drivers. Even just yesterday, a DoorDash driver delivered some food and the customer told them it looked like it had been crushed by a, a bike or something like it had been run over. And so that reflects poorly on your restaurant as well. So you have to really think about, are these good relationships to have when you're representing your brand? Or do you want to put that trust in a random delivery driver? It's obviously, it's very expensive to have your own delivery drivers. You have to think about insurance and labor costs and coordinating and planning how to deliver those orders. Um, so obviously that's complicated and not everyone can do it, but it's just something to keep in mind when you're bringing in third parties. Um, and curbside pickup and delivery, I there has definitely been a little bit of a drop off as far as curbside. I think people are a lot more comfortable coming into a space to pick up food, but having that as an option is still a great idea because there will be people who would rather just not get out of their car. And I don't blame them. <laughs> the first time that I ordered online at the beginning of the pandemic, I had ordered from Talk. So I picked up, I had ordered my food. I drove to the spot. They told me to text when I got there. Someone came out and just opened the back door and threw my food in there. And it was the coolest thing ever. I was just so excited to not have to get out of my car in the middle of winter or, you know, I, I'm from Chicago, so it's always cold. And so being able to just have the food put in my car without having to get out was a really, really nice experience. Um, and delivery too, with the third party apps, it's just such a convenience that people are always going to like. Um, and even if people do go back to the office, the fact that you can just order online, come pick it up and get back to the office right away is just such a convenience um, when you're busy, when you're running around, Maybe you have a, a house full of kids, you're trying to get home in time for dinner. A lot of this is just making lives e customers' lives easier. And the more of this that you can do, the better. All right, so here are a few of the trends. And uh, these are trends that maybe existed a little bit before the pandemic, but during the pandemic, it became more and more common for operators to try and innovate, do something different. Customers love the experience. They love brands. They, they're they probably coming to your coffee shop because they love your Instagram or they love your branding or they love um, the staff. The, people are so much attuned to the experience that they're getting from your shop. And so that is ab absolutely not going away. Anything you can do to encourage people to come back, try something new. Maybe it's a, a meal kit or a virtual cooking class or a, you know, talk with the, the, chef. <clears throat> the chef. There's so many great ways to make that experience more exciting. Um, and ghost kitchens, shared kitchens, this is a really big trend that is definitely not going away. We, we've worked with several brands that have opened a space in a shared kitchen as an option because it's cheaper than starting their own new brick and mortar space. It's a great way to test out new concepts, new menu items without the expense of opening a whole new shop, doing all the branding, doing all the marketing, doing all the install work. 
you know, it, for a, a low monthly fee, I mean, not, not super cheap, but you know, somewhere in the thousand dollar range to have access to a full kitchen and all the equipment you need with other, other concepts, other restaurants in the same space is a really great, great way to roll out some of those new concepts. Um, ghost kitchens. It's, it's funny when I talk with some of my friends who have never heard of a ghost kitchen and explaining it to them is like the most shocking thing that they've ever heard. Uh, I, I tell them like, you know, that, uh, Joe's juice bar down the street, or, or it's not down the street. You're ordering from Joe's juice bar on Grubhub and it's coming from somewhere and you've never seen Joe's juice bar in your neighborhood, but somehow it's listed online. That's coming from a warehouse, probably a couple of miles away with a, a uniquely branded Joe's juice bar, or um, maybe there's a burger place on there that you've never heard of. Um, a lot of this has to do with the data that has been gathered by customers in that neighborhood. So ghost kitchens are popping up all over major cities. They're using the data of the, the demographics of the area to say, okay, there's, there's no barbecue in this neighborhood, but people are ordering a lot of barbecue from Grubhub. So let's throw a barbecue restaurant in there. People are ordering a lot of French fries. Let's throw a French fry place in there. Um, it's, it's something that is not going away. And it, it's definitely making the world more interesting for customers because you can get whatever you want whenever you want. And that's just sort of the way that the world has become in general, not just for the restaurant industry. You know, you can order anything that you could need at the touch of a button. And food is not any different. If you if you want, uh, maybe this is different in more rural areas, but if you want a hamburger, you're going to get a hamburger. You can have it literally delivered to your doorstep in a matter of minutes. It's it, That's just not going away. People love the convenience. Um, and pre-orders, you know, just the idea of ordering ahead and not having to pull out your credit card, deal with signing a check at the end of the meal. Um, there's great ways that you can do this by setting like a prefix menu, or maybe there's an experience package that you're offering, um, some sort of meal kit as well. Um, a lot of that has to do with just setting something up online that allows your customers to purchase ahead of time, come pick it up and not have to deal with the headaches of charging a credit card or um, signing something. And then what I spoke about earlier too with customer data, that's just going to become more and more of a big deal for any operator um, who wants to learn more about, about their customers and really improve their, their business. So using that data, um, I know it's not the most exciting thing in the world, but if you're trying to grow business, you have to look at that data. And the more data you have, the more you know about your customers, the better experience you can provide. Um, you know, and uh, we've already talked about all of these online ordering techniques. Maybe you're finding that everybody is, maybe a majority of your customers are ordering ahead. Maybe that means you have to innovate and open a new location that is takeout only. And we've seen several customers decide that they're just doing takeout forever because it means less staff. It means less space is needed for their location. Um, and a lot of that was was evolved from the data that they received from their point of sale or their online ordering system. They just realized it's not worth it to have our staff come back because we're making so much money from online orders, which is great in some ways. Um, and I think a lot of us will be a little bit bummed if we can't go hang out in our favorite coffee shop like we used to. But there's so much to say about the the cost savings and the ability to innovate when you are looking at the data that you have. Um, that's just about all I have as far as my presentation, but I did see quite a few questions come in. Um, here's my information. Um, if anybody does have extra questions that we don't cover today or wants to learn more about a specific industry, this is sort of a very broad presentation. I, I know some of you maybe own coffee shops, maybe you own a cafe, maybe you own, um, maybe you own a, um, a retail store that just sells beans. Um, a lot of this is going to be different depending on your business. So we really 
encourage you to reach out if you have other questions. Uh, I do see Andy has been answering questions <laughs> while I was talking, um, and I did see quite a few questions pop up. So, uh, hi, Stephen. <laughs> hi. Hey, Louisa. Uh, thank you, first of all. That was excellent. Um, it's There's just so much to it. There's just, like, I haven't yeah. worked in a company setting for a while, a good, good while, and I felt like I was kind of on top of it, and there's... A certain amount, I think I've like observed observed as a consumer, uh, the yeah. customer. But just yeah. like it, just it keeps going, and it, it is kind of a topic that's come up in a few times that we had the call, the talk yesterday with Lara Marrero from Gensler, and we talked a lot about how like she had this idea about like you know electricity has kind of like went from being not a thing to a thing that is now invisible, and that technology is kind of going the same way, and how much we digitize the space is sort of just like in everything, and there was lots of mm -hmm. questions from the when watching around how do you do that in a way that doesn't feel intrusive and oh yeah I, there's yeah. um there's a lot a lot of questions here but i want to sneak my question in first which is just about you know what do you think are that is there a rubric for doing it so like how do you if you're assessing which tech to introduce to your space that might be on top of the fundamentals is there a rubric to kind of decide like is this worth doing Do we want to wait six months to a year to two years to see if it pans out like how do you think people should assess new ideas, new tech that they hear about? Yeah, I think it depends if you are a brand new uh, coffee shop or cafe, and maybe this is the first time you've ever done anything like this. And so that's going to be a lot of research up front if you haven't done this before. Um, but if you have worked in a space before, there probably are a few systems that you really enjoyed using. There's probably a handful that you really didn't like using. So we always you know, encourage people to use their experience with the systems that they have used before, maybe talking around and asking other operators what they've used and liked. Um, obviously, you want to be cautious of the costs. There are a lot of systems that cost way too much money, and maybe you can get that price down by negotiating a, a lease for equipment, for example, um, because when you're opening a new space, you think about all the terminals you need to have all the credit card readers all the printers that can be really expensive so you obviously you want to do your research make sure it's the right system because pulling that out later and replacing it with something else is going to be quite the headache and we we're, we're yeah. helping do that we're helping people do that every day we have restaurants that made it this far into covid and they're realizing this isn't going away we need a system that is really going to help people order online seamlessly it's going to save our our staff time um, and so that's that's something to keep in mind too. Is you know, is this going to make your staff's life easier? Because if not, they're going to be complaining about it, and they're going to be frustrated, and customers are going to be frustrated. So um, anything you can do to ask your staff's opinion, because if you're the owner, maybe you're not there every day, maybe you don't know what the process is like. Um, that's that's probably the advice I'd give. Well, I I just. I, I promise I'll get to the questions because there's quite a few of them. But the that there's been a running theme throughout the retail summit so far about the necessity of people and the, the role people play and, and the the need to find good people and treat them well and kind of trust in them and how much they are they will define the success of, of a business. And I, I think about the education needs with all of this and how much training is required to sort of create that comfort level and create that sort of trust. Is that, a, is that, do you think that's recognized? Do you think that, that, that people understand that, that this, all of these tools require a lot of training or is that a flaw of the yeah. tool that needs a lot of training? Yeah, I, that's a huge, huge issue with, you know, people who've been working in the industry for a long time and they've probably gone through three or four different systems. Right. Um, when you're hiring, you know, you can't always say like, oh, have you used Toast before? Because maybe they haven't. Um, but that's something that these tech companies are really trying to improve is the experience for the person actually using it. So is it going to be user-friendly? Are the buttons really big? Is it easy to close out at the end of the night? There is a lot of skill required in some of these systems. And we tell people all the time, you're in this industry because you like to make coffee. You're not in this industry because you like unplugging printers and plugging them back in or checking right. if the internet is down. Like, But unfortunately, that is kind of part of the job at this point um, is, you know, 
making sure everything's running smoothly. And some of that's just operational, you know, training your staff to know what to do when something goes wrong. Right. But there's just so much that can't be done on the fly. Like sometimes you're the only barista in the shop. Like I've seen this before. There's like 10 people waiting in line and orders aren't coming through. Like if they have an issue, they can't just drop everything and call right. support. Like it's impossible. And that's, I mean, that's like why we do what we do is because we understand that there's just no way you have time. Well, you missed it at the start of the talk. When you first started speaking, there was a number of people in the chat just talking about their anxiety levels. So that it was going to be remembering kind of just anxiety inducing moments around tech. And yeah. I, can, I, I can still remember when I worked my first job at Brista, like when the card reader would go down and you have to make a phone yeah. call. And I, so stressful. I never actually <laughs> fully figured it out. I always just like you know, asking like, Joanne, do you know how to do this? Would you mind, you, you call the number, you've done the number before. Yeah. Cause I yeah. just, it was, yeah. Okay, let's yeah. go to some of the questions. So um, there's a first question here, but should we accept Dogecoins payments and tipping? I think Dogecoins. Andy may have got to that, but I guess the question of just like non, non-traditional currencies and, and payment types. Yeah, we're not seeing it we're not seeing it with our customers yet, but with the transition to online ordering and being able to buy pay with multiple sources, um, obviously like Venmo, PayPal, all these different ways to pay. I think you talked about this earlier. It's just, there's so many ways to pay and we want to make sure that every customer can order the way they want to. So if right. that's the way that the, the industry shifts, then, you know, you're going to have to keep up as an operator. You're going to have to be able to accept any kind of currency that people want to pay. Yeah, you did say that before. You got to you got to help. You know, make sure they can order the way they want to order and pay the mm -hmm. way they want to pay. That's yeah. an interesting idea. Okay, so another question here: What is the one bit of tech that uh, food and beverage businesses always overlook that is either a super integral or b really key to creating a smooth customer experience? Yeah. Well, I already stressed a lot about internet because everything revolves around the internet. So you have to have stable connection maybe. And, and probably all of you have upgraded your, your home internet too at this point because it's so crucial to everything we do. Um, and it's, it's not the most glamorous or exciting thing, but it's so important. Like, yeah, you can have a beautiful website or you can have a beautiful shop, but if that doesn't work, then it's going to totally destroy the customer experience so if you have even the first outage and, and during the first week if you have a major outage and you can't accept credit cards that's super important um, another thing too that probably gets overlooked is the data that yeah. you have because operators are so busy on a day-to-day -day, they don't really and, and they're probably not data analysts too you know they're not tech people they're not data analysts it's it's not something that we're all skilled in and some people will hire like a consultant to help them figure out what their next moves are. But just being able to export, you know, your customer list, even if it's something as simple as that exporting your customer list and trying to retarget them through different means. Um, and we see this all the time. People don't have a marketing person internal. And so it's usually the owner or a manager right. handling all of that. But yeah, it, and is that, and is it's that great that it's easy. Sorry, oh, sorry. Is, that, is that true for single operations or is that true for even small chains? Yeah, it's it's definitely for everyone. Um, if you are a larger chain, you probably have the advantage of having a marketing person who can weed through all the data. Yeah. Uh, but as a single owner operator, even just taking a look at what your POS offers, because there's probably a lot of features you're not paying attention to. Uh, there's just so much like the, everything that's been rolled out because of COVID and a lot of times the point of sale company will charge extra for things like uh, integrated online ordering or integrated gift cards or uh, integrated third party apps. A lot of this does cost extra, but if you can get on their website and maybe it means talking with a salesperson and saying, hey, do I need all of this? What can I add on? What will make my life, e my life easier? Um, it's really great to double check that you're using the system to its full capacity. And you said earlier that hardware is kind of like key. I, I've got a neighbor who we store for Comcast and I remember his house was just like, everything was wired. And he was like, no, 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 what, wired yeah. everything. And he had like his lighting system in his garden was all wired. And I remember scoffing a bit, but I guess yeah. it's just more dependent or is it? 
Yeah, is, it's is it's going to be more dependent. Or is it performance? It's it's mostly the performance, um, and probably if you're working from home, you've had experiences where it gets kind of glitchy, or mm -hmm. sound cuts out, or video cuts out. Um, being hardwired is is always going to be the safest bet. Um, or you know, if you're maybe you're far away from the internet source, Wi-Fi can be spottier. Um, yeah. And it's it's just something that a lot of operators don't think about too, is like, what is this gonna look like when I open my shop? Are there gonna be wires hanging all over the place? Yeah. Where's the where's the IT room? Where's the IT closet gonna be? And so that's usually why we like to talk with like brand new locations before they open, because that way we can see where are the data jacks, uh, where are you gonna put a phone, where are you gonna put the all the hardware? How is it going to, like, what are the cables going to look like when they run through the whole shop? That's something that you don't think about when you're trying to open a new coffee shop. Yeah. In fact, I'm, a, I'm having a vivid memory of, so, you know, disclaimer, I used to work with your business partner, Andy Freivogel at Intelligentsia, and I can remember Andy insisting he be involved in the build out of a new space, a new coffee bar, yeah. for exactly the reasons you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Less me talking, more, uh, let's see, question from Josh. What are your thoughts on the Shopify retail POS so that there's no need for a CMS on top of Shopify and Square, for example, and there's total integration from the get-go? Basically, do you recommend using multiple vendors for solutions, or is it just better to streamline and use the same vendor for e-commerce and POS ordering? Good question. Yeah, that's a great question. It definitely depends on your business, what you're selling and how much your budget is. And so we, we come across this all the time with single operators is that they don't have a very large IT budget and they think I need something that can do everything. It's like, okay, well, if you want that, it's going to be pretty expensive. If you're, <laughs> if you have the budget for it, great. Uh, you know, like Shopify for retail POS, um, it's a little pricier than square, for example, because you have all of these extra add-ons that you need to make it work. Um, if you really want it to be super customized, like, offering subscriptions or really gathering more customer data that you can retarget to them. That's all great, but it's only if you, if you can afford it. Um, and Square, right. there are some integrations um, and, and they're great, but it's, it's also not going to be the solution for someone that is doing a lot of online ordering. Um, like we have a customer in Chicago who's um, moving to just take out, like just a window you order. Um, and so she wants to also sell you know, frozen goods, books, t-shirts, uh, hot cocoa kits, all this other stuff um, so that she can sell it across the country. Square is not going to be the best system for that. So it depends too if you're if you're planning on selling all across the country, if you need to drop ship stuff, if you need to, um, if you want to do like local delivery. I know Shopify has rolled out a few new features as far as like cur curbside pickup or mm -hmm dispatching delivery drivers so um yeah hopefully yeah. that answers the question <laughs> but we, we do we do uh free consultations mm -hmm. with a lot of uh, operators and we kind of go through this checklist of like what are your major needs but let's let's get it all on the table before we make a decision because we don't want to change later we want to make the right decision from the get-go and i would imagine a lot of i mean there's always this kind of conversation about the peril of people opening cafes as passion projects and yeah. not really going into it with a business plan, so to speak, that's kind of beyond just like, I love me, I love being around people and doing this. And so um, do you find in those conversations, it's a pretty enlightening for people that like they're going, oh, I never, I didn't think of any of these things. Yeah, I, I literally just talked to someone who's opening a bar yesterday and I was like, okay, well, like he's, he, he had a checklist of things. So I was like, well, let's, let's go through your checklist. And he's like, well, I have point of sale. I was like, okay, well, what about phones? Yeah. What about online ordering? What about, um, like, are you going to sell merch? Like, all this other stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah, I got to yeah. think about that stuff. <laughs> and a lot uh, of that's let's... not fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, 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 uh, it's really fascinating. Okay, let's see. What percentage of the specialty coffee shops do you feel rely on landline phones as essential hardware? I don't think I've really seen a barista take a phone call, maybe being replaced with texting. Yeah, so a lot of that is probably texting. They they probably are using their own cell phone to like if they need to communicate with the point a uh, tech support person, um, they're more than likely texting 
uh, yeah, it's it's not often that people will, they're probably not calling in their orders, customers aren't calling in their orders, but if you're a restaurant or somebody wants to know your hours, um, it could be as simple as just setting up an auto attendant. Like, hey, this is our store, these are our hours, this is how you order, whatever you need to tell them. It, it's probably, if they're calling, it's probably to ask one of those questions. So mm -hmm. it's better to just have some sort of auto attendant rather than like no phone number at all, because I think that frustrates customers is like, knowing that they have no way to get answers when they need them. That's very interesting, yeah. Okay, what are some of the key elements of a delivery partner that a business should consider if they have options? And there's sort of a secondary question to that same thing about is there a checklist, uh, what should we be looking for, in potential tech partners? I think we kind of got to, but uh, I think with the delivery partner piece, I'm curious what you have to say about it. Yeah, yeah, so at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of, third parties that said, we're not going to charge fees, or you can sign up for free, we'll send you all the equipment you need. There's always a catch. And we, we <laughs> and they were struggling just as much as everyone else at the beginning of the pandemic. So I understand. Um, but you really want to make sure you're being charged the right commission fee. We, we've had to have those conversations with third party apps is, hey, you're charging this customer, this restaurant, 30% and you told them that it would be 15 and they're like, Oh yeah, sorry. We'll correct it. Like it, there's just really? so much of that going on. Yeah. And so you, you definitely want to be cautious of that. And a lot of people think like, okay, let's get on all the platforms. That's great. But if you don't have a way to integrate that with your point of sale, you're going to be punching in all those tablets, just like the, the picture I, I showed earlier, yeah. you're going to have all these tablets and you're going to be checking at the end of the day, did everything go into our system? Because then you have all this data in different places too. You have to think about that. Like, are you getting the data from Grubhub, Uber Eats and your point of sale? Like, do you even know how much your sales are? Because it's across all these different systems. Um, so if you can find a way to integrate it with their point of sale, that's definitely key. And then the commission fees and, you know, are, are other restaurants happy with their service? Like are, a lot of people complaining about delivery drivers showing up late or delivery drivers ruining the food. Um, so you really have to be careful with that. And are there any kind of, you know, I mean, ERP systems that I'm thinking of that's at a more micro level that would take serve as a dashboard for all of those various inputs? Does that exist? Yeah, yeah, there are several aggregators that exist, um, like Kubo, Chowley, Otter. These are all systems that pull all of the third party apps into a system and then they print out a ticket in your point of sale, which mm -hmm. is great, but we found that is definitely the most, the most trouble tickets that we get is related to online ordering integrations because the, the tickets aren't printing from Uber Eats. They're not coming into the point of sale. Um, and that's just, it, wow. I think because a lot of these systems rolled out so quickly and they you know had all these high expectations um, but we've had several customers sign up for these these aggregators and then later down the road just say, you know, let's just forget about it. Let's just do something else. Let's switch to a different system because it's not working. Right. Okay. I'm going to flag that we have seven minutes left. So I'm going to try to get to all these questions. Um, <laughs> any technology tech services you're particularly excited about or that we should keep an eye out for? Uh, is, is this related to systems that we're excited about, I'm guessing. <clears throat> the question just says services. I guess there's any new, any things in, in the works or that, you, that you're in the horizon that you're excited about? Yeah, yeah. So we're really excited about different ways to collect customer data. Like I was saying earlier, like people probably aren't coming back into the cafes as much as they used to, but if they are, you want to know as much as you can about them. And so if you have the ability to collect, you know, data from the Wi-Fi portal that you're using, mm -hmm. that's great. Um, if you can collect it through, you know, maybe you offering coupons, if someone gives you your, their email address or something like that, um, there's just so much going on as far as retargeting your customers. That's really exciting. Like I'm, I'm definitely a marketing person. So I love the idea of customized, uh, ads like when I see stuff on Instagram and I'm like, oh my gosh, how did they know? That's what I actually want. Like I, I love to see that too. When I get a, a coupon and an email from my favorite coffee shop, 
like, how did they know that I wanted to order that latte? <laughs> so yeah. they, there's definitely a lot going on there. Um, and I, I just get excited about the physical space in general. Like I am such a foodie. My whole team is made up of foodies and coffee people. And so we love the actual experience of going into a shop, having that like friendly barista and they, they know what you want already. If you go there all the time, I don't think that's going away. I think people are really craving that. It's just a matter of <clears throat> finding the right technology to make that as seamless as possible so that there's no yeah. issue of your order getting mixed up or getting forgotten. Yeah. That it can, it's, an, it's a, a way to enhance rather than to distract. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it should all be behind behind closed doors. No one has to see all the technology yeah. out in front of them. <laughs> okay, let's see two more here. Uh, earlier today, another presentation referenced omnichannel. I'd love to know if it's possible to create that kind of thoughtful, consistent experience using third party software and just being mindful about it, or is is custom the only way to really own everything from top to bottom? I would definitely advise against anything customized. I mean, if you're a super large chain and you can afford it, it is an option to consider, but there's so many third-party solutions out there that you can pick and choose and make it all work to your advantage. Uh, like I mentioned, the online ordering aggregators, although the technology isn't totally there yet, I think it will be a great solution in the future for operators to take orders from just about anywhere. So yeah. their third parties, their website, in person, phone orders, it should all be coming to the same centralized place. So that's what you really need to focus on. Um, a lot of that's just choosing the right point of sale too. And like I said before, making sure your point of sale has the ability to integrate online orders. And I think someone else mentioned a CMS, like there's just a lot of solutions that have those included and so it's something to definitely consider when you're choosing your point of sale and the last question too is whether there is value in building an app <clears throat> versus using ordering platforms but i think you just spoke to that the yeah there's i will i will talk really quickly about that though um i, I didn't talk much about it in my presentation but everyone thinks like oh let's make our own app and it, it could work if you are like the only coffee shop in your neighborhood and everyone's going there all the time but people don't want to download an app. Like we've been saying this for years, like the app way of doing things is probably on its way out. People want to just scan a QR code or go to your website, yeah. or they're probably Googling your name and clicking the first button. That's another thing that I didn't mention is you really need to check your Google My Business profile. Like do it right now if you haven't, because they could be sneaky. They're going to put whatever button benefits Google on the top. Um, we've had customers call and tell us that uh, Google had put a fake phone number up there, leading them to order through the restaurant, but then Grubhub would be taking a percentage because it came through that phone number. Uh, like there's just, there's so much sneaky stuff going around. So um, that's something you really have to be cautious of. And people aren't probably aren't aware of is that these third parties are trying to make money any way that they can. And you want to make sure that, your customers are ordering from the way that you want them to order from. Yeah. Okay, we have two minutes. I've got a quick question about, in your experience of working with larger chains and smaller operations, do you see, I would imagine, and tell me if I'm wrong, the larger chains are, have, are able to invest in data analytics so that they are actually kind of have a better understanding of their customer profiles and ordering times, et cetera. And knowing that that is now available for smaller operations, maybe you know the time to invest in the people to do that. But are smaller operations more nimble in trying new things versus bigger operations? Is that a fair assumption? Is that still ring true? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just talking with an operator with 46 units, and they're still on this old, ancient system because the thought of rolling it out a new system at 46 locations is just, Terrifying. it's a huge, huge task. And we're helping another, you know, 12 unit chain that's working on implementing a new point of sale and that's months and months and months of planning making sure you're picking the right system training your staff whereas if you're a single coffee shop you're just like oh let's switch to square maybe it's a couple yeah. weeks of uh, you know figuring it out getting used to it but it's definitely a lot easier when you just have one location to deal with yeah we could talk for a long time and i think the questions that keep coming in louisa thanks so much it yeah, was so great. Yeah, thank you. you.
it's such an honor to have you. And I think uh, it's so fascinating to hear you talk about this. I know you had all your contact details up there and you've been dropping them in the chat as well. So people can contact you and yep. the team at Science on Call. What's the website again? The scienceoncall.com. Scienceoncall.com. Yeah. All right. So, well, uh, next right. up is a talk. Yeah, the next up is our, is our uh, impact of COVID on especially coffee community with my colleagues, Peter Giuliano and Katie Jane, um, and uh, what they've learned a year later. So stay tuned, everybody, and thanks so much for tuning in.